Yeah. Well, look, th thanks. Thanks for doing this. Uh, you know, I, obviously, Oliver, you, with your with your resume, former U.S. USA coach, coach of Dayton, DePaul, uh, Clemson, Bradford, uh, you, you've got a lot of basketball experience just uh, and knowledge. But what we, what we were doing uh, during the lockdown, we all had too much time on our hands. And uh, we started a Facebook group um, just for Northern Virginia basketball players and uh, coaches, officials as well. We started posting stuff on Facebook and uh, it was amazing how much following and how much passion we have for the game. And so we, uh, Following up on that, we started doing some podcasts with some of the heroes in the area. A guy named Jim Lewis, who you may know. Jim, oh, Jim was the oh, yeah, he knows everybody. He was the first guy to integrate the Northern Virginia uh, leagues, the uh, public school leagues. And then he was the first, he integrated the West Virginia team. And then he was the first black assistant at, at, uh, at Duke as well. So we've, we've, been, we've been talking to some of the Northern Virginia uh, basketball stalwarts. And I, I was dying to get you on here. It's not only is your basketball um, uh, story incredible um, and you've talked you've coached and coached with uh, lots of Northern Virginia players uh, but some of the experiences you had I thought would be great to catch to catch on uh, on, on YouTube so folks can actually hear them for themselves. Well I'll be be glad to share what I remember it's been a while. <laughs> yeah yeah while. yeah well, why, don't we, why don't we start from the beginning I, I know you grew up in Ocean City um, and uh, Berlin uh, a small town a couple miles inland and People from Northern Virginia, when we think about uh, Ocean City, it's it's a weekend beach place. It's it's a week long beach in the summer, but you grew up about the same time the Bay Bridge was built. So what what people probably don't realize is Ocean City you grew up in was very remote. I mean, there was only a ferry to get across uh, to get to Ocean City. It wasn't a place you took a three hour trip like 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 we do now. So first, what was it like to grow up in in the Ocean City Ocean City Maryland area? Well, you know, obviously that was a time uh, back when things were, uh, you know, still segregated, uh, particularly the schools uh, system. In fact, uh, the high school that I, that I ended up uh, attending, Steve Nicator, which is right there on 50, integrated the year before I went to junior, senior high school. Back then it was junior and senior high school together. And so it was a very different uh, situation, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Ocean City, which was only five miles away from where I grew up, was a uh, resort town, still is a resort town, but really was a ghost town. I mean, there was nothing going on during the winter. And then, of course, summer, you know, the, the crowds would swell and so on and so forth. Uh, Ocean City is a place that I, uh, you know, kind of grew up. I worked there in the summer times at, uh, you know, different jobs from cutting grass or washing dishes and that kind of thing. And and that's literally where I played most of the time because, uh, you know, where I grew up in Berlin, five miles away, there were no asphalt fault or cement courts. You played on it. We built our own courts and played on the dirt. And then finally at, at Ocean City, down by City Hall, they finally put up an outdoor court with an asphalt, uh, you know, asphalt court. And man, we thought we were in heaven. So <laughs> every chance we got, we hitchhiked. Uh, to Ocean City, uh, you know, almost every day and, and, and play on those uh, four street courts. And that's, uh, you know, the place where I, I really learned to play, finally started to play against players from other places because, you know, that uh, Berlin, the Eastern Shore wasn't a place where you, you had a lot of, uh, you know, players floating through, uh, unlike D.C., Virginia, Maryland, those areas. But, you know, a lot of you guys would come down during the summer and I'd get to play against you and pick up games and that kind of thing. And I started to realize, uh, you know, how far, uh, you know, I had to go to be a, a decent player, but it was, uh, like I said, it was very different. We segregated and, and it's changed a lot now that uh, it's more of a year round place and, uh, you know, much more exposed to the world than it was then. But uh, it, it was a good place to grow up in that there wasn't a lot of things to get in trouble uh, with in terms of, uh, you know, gangs or this or that, none of that going on. We were down in the country, down in farm country, and then of course the resort in the summertime. Did you, when you play pickup, did you play, was it integrated the pickup uh, or did you play just with other black, other black players? Well, early on it was just black players, but then as I got up into high school and again, where I was able to go to Ocean City every day, we played against, uh, you know, players from all over, all backgrounds and, and particularly a lot from the Pennsylvania, uh, Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. So it, it, it was integrated at that point. 
so there, but there were no leagues for kids. So you didn't in the winter time. There were there were no leagues for you to play. Is that right? No, no, no there was no leagues. That was just all pick up, and uh, we were fortunate, obviously, to you know, have our own teams, you know, at the high school. But that that was it. There was no AAU. That was even in existence at that time, and and there were no summer leagues uh, down on the Eastern Shore. Although you know, summer leagues were big up in the DC area, as you remember from the Jellof League. Uh, yeah. You know, on back, but none of that uh, was down on the Eastern Shore. We just basically played on the dirt and the asphalt and felt fortunate to, to have pickup games uh, three or four times a week. So so where would you have gone to school if the schools weren't integrated? What, what school would you have gone to? If they weren't integrated, I uh, mm-hmm. would have gone to my sister, who's two years older than me, went to Worcester High School uh, for mm-hmm. her entire uh, you know secondary education. That was uh, 15, 16 miles away. And, you know, obviously, you know, bus trip and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but that's where I would have would have gone to school, went to Flyer Street mm-hmm. Elementary School, which obviously no longer exists. And then uh, when I made the shift from elementary school to junior high school, that's the year before Steve McCater was integrated and myself and 12 other African-American kids, uh, you know, we were the only ones there. Wow. So the, the Worcester uh, High School, did they have a, a basketball tradition? Because I, like in Virginia, as oh, you yeah. remember, it looked like Luther Jackson and all the schools, they had a rich uh, basketball tradition. Yeah, for the Eastern Shore, Worcester High School had a, a really good tradition. Uh, they had some you know, outstanding teams over the years. They had some outstanding players, you know, guys like Calvin Skinner who played in the Seattle Supersonics for so many years. And so they, they, they had some tradition. And, you know, I grew up wanting to be a, a, a Worcester High Indian. Uh, wow. You know, if you will. In fact, uh, my wife uh, actually went to Worcester for one or two years and was a cheerleader uh, down at Worcester High School. So it's, it's it's kind of interesting when you look back on it. And as I mentioned, my sister went there the entire time. So so when you when you got to uh, Decatur, uh, I, I this probably goes without saying, but there was a lot was a lot of tension there when when you first started out there. Yeah, it was just so different, uncomfortable is the way I would put it for sure. Uh, I wouldn't say a lot of tensions. So obviously, the first couple of days, first few days you were there was just so different from, you know, everything that I'd experienced up to that point in terms of, you know, friends and uh, teachers and uh, coaches and all, you know, they, those were, you know, all the, uh, you know, the black folks that influenced me for so many years. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're in this environment where, uh, most of that is, you know, most of that's a white environment, and it definitely was un- uncomfortable for for a while. And you could certainly feel, uh, you know, some of the uh, bias and, and prejudice and, and, and racism uh, from time to time. But uh, you know, my my mother, um, mainly my mother, mother and father told me a long time ago, "Hey, listen, you know, you are you are different. You got to be better. You can't uh, use this as an excuse." Uh, you know, you got to keep pushing, pushing forward. You stand up for yourself in you know, every way you need to, but, you know, it cannot be a, an excuse that you're being treated this way or that way or looked down upon or whatever. You, you've got to, you've got to push through and you've got to be better. And, you know, that, that's what I taught you and you better do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So did, did some of the teachers from Worcester come with you guys or was it, was the staff mostly white at that, at that time? No, some of the teachers actually, uh, you know, uh, transferred or, or, or you know took jobs in in the uh, the new school system. Uh, not not a lot, but some some did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I can imagine um, from the folks I talked about in North Virginia, a lot of those tensions kind of abated once the basketball season started. Because because uh, I'm I'm sure once once you have a common enemy, the the other team, uh, things tend to work out a little bit better. Oh, no question about it. That's what made it comfortable. The fact that I was able to play you know, basketball in particular, right, right away. That was a sanctuary. I mean, once, once I was on the court, I was, you know, I loved the sport and, you know, loved a lot of sports, but particularly basketball. And once you're, I was on the court and, and, uh, and on a team, I mean, that was, uh, you know, that was everything, uh, you know, to me. I mean, even though my mom stressed academics ahead of athletics, that, that wasn't my mindset. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. loved sports and particular basketball and it made everything better. So you played you played football and, and uh, baseball as well. No, we didn't have uh, we had a, we were a poor school. We didn't have football, but I did yeah, play football. baseball and I played soccer. Uh, you, you, know, you had soccer, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so how how did your I, I would think uh, with an infusion of talent, 
the, the team probably did much better. I, I guess maybe the other teams were integrated and getting, getting more talent as well. So but how, how the team do, I know you guys made a state, you guys won the state championship at some point. Yeah, we, uh, the, the, pro, the, the team was not very good before the school was, uh, uh integrated and, uh, you know, as a result of that, uh, you know, and hopefully some work and coaching and all that, our, our team got better and better. I think uh, once I was in high school, I think we lost five games in the, uh, you know, three years that I was on the, uh, on the varsity team. We were runner up in the state uh, states my June, my sophomore year. We won the states my junior year and we were runner up in the state my senior year. So we uh, you know, we, we progressed pretty quickly and became a, you know, a, a powerhouse, obviously, over on the shore. And, uh, and then, you know, once we uh, uh, were comfortable, we were able to go across the bridge and, and win some games. We first went over there. We got our ears pinned back, for sure. But finally yeah. won the title in 1970. And, uh, you know, what, what, what a feeling that was. What, what a, a, a feeling of accomplishment. Was that a cold, was that a cold field house, the uh, state championship? Yes, yes, back okay. in the day, right, when everything was a cold field house. And of course, that, you know, seemed like we were playing in, you know, in a, a castle or something. And, it's, and it's re it really is a big place. That was always a big, spacious place. But that, yeah. you know, we died and gone to heaven once we were able to go to a cold field house for the state, state tournament. Right. So my guess is uh, you got more, that gave you some exposure to college coaches going to state um, because they, they, it might have been harder to find you in Ocean City. Even and they didn't have the, re the recruiting list that we have today, and they didn't have scouts everywhere. So my guess is those state runs is what probably got the attention of Old Dominion. No question, no question mm -hmm. about it. Uh, we don't go to the state tournament and probably never get found over on the uh, over on the Eastern Shore. Uh, but uh, Old Dominion was one of the schools that saw me there, and then there was uh, schools like Boston U and some of the smaller, you know, Maryland State schools and, and that kind of thing. But I, it's not like I was heavily recruited, but I uh, was recruited enough that Boston U and Old Dominion became schools I was very interested in and took visits, took official visits there and, and then kind of made a decision from, from there. But, you know, absent uh, going to College Park and playing the state tournament, it would have been, it would have been difficult to, uh, to have been seen by those schools. Yeah. So who, who was the coach at Old Dominion there? Was that, was that Paul Webb? No, no, actually that was Sonny Allen. Sonny Allen's a guy that I played for. He is the, uh, he is a modern day architect. Or I shouldn't say modern day anymore, but uh, of the numbered fast break, you know, back, uh, he's the first guy that, you know, uh, created a number fast break and wrote a book on it. And that was his big, you know, his big thing. And that was our, the, the, the huge, uh, component of our style of play is, is, uh, is that number break and, and a lot of fun. We won a lot of ball games, won the uh, Division II National Championship uh, there my senior year. And uh, so just had a really good playing experience and, you know, a lot of fun there at, uh, at Old Dominion. Was, was the fact that it was a beach community, any, um, did it make any difference to your decision making or was, it was the best opportunity for you at the time? Yeah, I, I think it was. Uh, yeah, I don't think the beach had much to do with it, even though I, I really enjoyed the fact that it was a similar place to where I grew up, you know, Norfolk, mm -hmm. Virginia Beach. I had a lot of similarities to Ocean City, obviously being proximity of the Atlantic Ocean and Chesapeake Bay and all of that. Uh, that made it more comfortable. But it was all about the basketball decision going down and visiting, watching a game, watching the crowd, watching that style of play. Uh, they had a point guard at that, at that time by the name of Dave Torzik, who went on to oh, yeah. Portland Trail Blazers and was an NBA champion. So he was a point guard on that, uh, on that team. And watching him and that team play, that, that, was, uh, that was pretty much uh, convinced. I was pretty much convinced after that. <laughs> so Old Dominion was, was Division Two, And, you know, we don't, Division two is, it's kind of shrunk. It's kind of changed over the years, but, but like, for example, one of the schools that you coached at Radford was also a division two school. Mm -hmm. it, it was, there was a lot bigger, uh, division two was much bigger back then. Uh, so what, 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 what's the difference? What kind of schools were division two in those days as, as compared to now? Well, just like you said, it's, it's, it's really changed, but back in those days, there were a lot of uh, really good players that played at the division two level, the NAIA level team, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, players that went on and played in the NBA. Uh, so there were a lot of, 
uh, of players that would would opt to go to those schools just simply because it was you know it was a good situation or maybe they didn't get seen uh, mm-hmm. you know by the Division one schools and so on and so forth. But if you went to a really good uh, Division two school, they played uh, a lot of Division one schools on their schedule. We played probably played ten or twelve Division one. Uh, teams and you know you had an opportunity in to compete for a national championship and, and, and that kind of thing but just a great experience and you know I never never really considered that much because again I had a uh, you know a couple other division one offers but I just thought that this was a better place to play basketball and basketball was more important uh, to them and not to mention that uh, you know I thought their teams are really really good teams and players are really good. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot to be said for going somewhere where you're going to play. I think a lot of a lot of people uh, they out they out kick their coverage in terms of selecting schools because we all we all want to go to the best school possible. But I think sometimes if you go to a school where you're going to be important and you're going to be relied upon, it can make a big a big difference in your experience. Oh, there's no question about it. You know, that, that kind of uh, reminds me of something that's going on now, which you know I don't know how I would function in this environment where players can literally transfer. Uh, now and play right away and uh, and and now there's a big thing that seems to me that you know teams are actually recruiting players from the opposition even in league to now transfer to their schools and, mm. and play right away I mean what a wild wild west uh you know that is I don't know how to function in, in, in that environment it just seems to me it changes the nature of of the sports certainly from a recruiting standpoint that you know you got your list of uh senior juniors and seniors in high school you got your list of junior college players and now you've got your list of uh, players mm-hmm. that you're looking around the country and saying you know boy i've got a relationship with that kid can i get him interested in transferring transfer him here so that, that's just really uh really really strange to me yeah it also makes you I uh, wonder who who's the authority figure now. Are the players in the authority or is coach the authority? You know, when I when I played, the coach was like a god. Uh, right. we, we see, we'd see a high school coach walking down the street, and you know, we we would point to him like, "Oh my god, that's like some kind of celebrity." Now, your coach, you're, you're begging these kids, you're begging these kids to stay in your program. That that's exactly right, and these kids have been recruited since they were in the eighth grade, many of them, to go to you know a, a high school in Northern Virginia or to go to a school in D.C. or or go across the line to Maryland, they've been recruited like that. And in terms of who the authority figure is, you get that, you got to figure that out because it's not necessarily uh, the parent. It's not necessarily the coach. It could be that AAU coach. It could be that mm-hmm. uncle that got him to go to the school in Northern Virginia to start with. And so it's just so different now, but identifying who is the actual influencer is a big mm-hmm. part of recruiting no matter what. But you, again, you can imagine uh, now that uh, you know a, a kid can leave your school, I said, and go to a, another school in your league and play against you right away, that just seems you know so strange to me, and uh, and kind of uh, I don't know counter uh, a counter loyalty because to me when we went to school, being loyal to your high school, your coach, and all that was was huge, and, and I think there's a there's a lot to that that's important. Uh, as you establish uh, who you're going to be in, in, in life and, you know, as a, a coach yourself or certainly a father and an influencer or a mentor to kids is, is teaching them loyalty and, mm-hmm. and instilling the importance of that. And I, I think you lose some of that when, you know, you start, uh, uh, you know, kind of scattering around and if things mm-hmm. don't go well here this week, well, <laughs> next week I'm going and play against you. <laughs> exactly. Well, it, it, we'll get back to Old Dominion in a second, but just as we're talking about recruiting, that was one of the things that you were known for as being a great recruiter as, as an assistant coach and then as a head coach. And I guess you're not, you're not going to ever be a head coach if you, if you can't prove you can recruit. Uh, do, do you think recruiting in, in this day would be would be easier for you because you have more information? Everyone has everyone has information. You can just go on YouTube and you can you can Google some some kid's name. And you can watch them play uh, immediately or the, the, the thing that sets you apart. Was the hard work you put in and the leg work you put in to find these kids? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I, I think you figure it out. Whatever the rules are, whatever the uh, technology is, you figure that out. But there's no substitute for putting in more time at it, where the work ethic, uh, turning over that 
you know, that extra, that extra rock, the things that you're doing when nobody else is, you know, is, is watching, uh, tends to be the separator. Now, obviously you've got to be someone who's innovative and forward thinking and, and, and willing to change with the rules and the, uh, and the times and, and obviously what, what interests kids. I mean, you gotta, you gotta know what's going on in the minds uh, of these young men, because I, I think that in recruiting and, and even in coaching, you know, you're in a battle every day for the hearts and minds of these kids to get them to do something that they ordinarily wouldn't do to get them to do it at a higher level. I mean, to me, that's the essence of coaching. So, uh, you know, the, the ability to build that kind of relationship where you can influence someone to go above and beyond what they normally would do. I think that's a big part of coaching. I think that's a big part of recruiting that relationship that you develop mm -hmm. in recruiting. First of all, allows you to get that young man to come to your school secondly, allows you to influence and coach them in a, in a very positive way. Hmm. So, so when you, when, when you're, we're back at Old, Old Dominion now, did, did you know when you were playing Old Dominion that you'd, you'd want, you'd want to coach one day? Was that a parent uh, back then? It was my junior year and it was a graduate assistant coach on, on our coaching staff. My name Ed Hall just, you know, he just asked me one day, you know, so, you know, what do you want to do, you know, when you graduate? And, you know, of course I said, well, I want to play in the NBA. And he said, well, you know, what do you want to do after that? And you know, I said, oh, well, I hadn't really thought about it. He said, well, you need to think about it. So make a long story short, I started to think about it. And, and you know, I realized I wanted to stay in the game. And so, you know, he asked me a couple of weeks later, I thought about it. I said, yeah, I think I'd like to coach. And so, then he says, what are you doing about it? And uh, so he's the first person that talked to me about a process of making sure that I was in a position to get into coaching if I really wanted to. And that process involved working camps in the summertime and uh, and he said just don't go work camps when you go to work camps there are other coaches there are college coaches or high school coaches their players there's a place that you need to develop relationships let's say if you're working for example uh, lefty grizel was a coach at maryland i worked his camp for uh, you know a couple of summers and and that's where that relationship started and you know when i left the camp i'd write letters and uh, and those kinds of things uh, with the idea of impressing the people that I met that I'm, you know, someone who's serious, serious about the game and uh, serious about developing uh, uh, relationships. So that's, that's when that started. I, I thank him to this day for making me really think about that and start the process that allowed me to, you know, after graduation, get right into coaching. Did you, uh, the things you learned at Old Dominion, uh, like the numbered fast break, are those things that you use as a coach? Oh yeah, no, I just so many things, uh, but certainly the things I that I learned uh, going all the way back to high school, but certainly at Old Dominion, the number break, uh, we use that, you know, uh, pra practically the entire time I coached, we use that. We just, you know, added things to it and we changed a lot of things o over over time, but yeah. Without question, things I learned at uh, Old Dominion as a player, uh, but also as a coach, because right after graduation, I was uh, an assistant coach at Old Dominion for 10 years and uh, before going on to the University of Maryland as assistant coach. Yeah. So you, you won the national championship at Old Dominion as well. Is that, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the girls also won the national championship because Nancy Lieberman was there around your time as well. Nancy came probably when I was a graduate. She was either my senior year or when I was a graduate graduate uh, assistant coach, and, uh, and and that was also a, a huge part of the. She was a part of that Title IX movement. That's when all of that first started, and Old Dominion embraced it early on as a Division II school, which went Division One by the way the year after I graduated, and so now she's there as a uh, great young prospect during the time that Old Dominion has you know, grabbed the reins and said, we're gonna put the resources in to you know, women's athletics and women's sports. And, and, and it was just perfect. Cause I think she, she won one or two national championships while she was there. Obviously she was consensus best player in the country and, and br brought a lot of notoriety, not only to Old Dominion, but women's sports in general, because it was during the heyday uh, the inception of uh, Title IX and Title IX legislation and Title IX actions that came down the, uh, the pike that still resonate to this day. Are you guys still in touch, you and Nancy? 
Uh, I'll see her from time to time because we played a we played a lot of pickup basketball, you know, back in the day. Got to know her really, really well. Probably been a couple three years since I've seen her, but yeah, we we spent a lot of time together. What a, a great person! Uh, and then you know what an extraordinary career she's had, both playing and, and coaching and being, you know, just a, a trailblazer. Mm. So, so next year you become an you become an assistant coach. Um, at, at, first of all, I assume you're a graduate assistant, and then you became an assistant coach. Um, and then, um, you, you, as you just said, it took it took ten years. And I think in um, you, you had such a successful career, um, you probably would assume nowadays that you would have got the head coaching job faster. But you know, head coaching jobs for minority coaches probably weren't as easy to come by in those days as they are now. Is that correct? I don't know what I was thinking when I you know set a goal to to be a uh, division one head coach because there was only like three uh, you know going around at that time there's John Thompson and, and George Rabling and a guy by the name of Fred Snowden in Arizona and uh, so it's not something like you, you look on TV or look in the magazine you go like well that, you know that's what I want to be and that person looks like me it just wasn't that wasn't there but uh, again my mother always taught me and said if you really want to do something there is no excuse you know you go after everything mm -hmm. you have and and chances are you're going to have a good chance to succeed. So that, that was, uh, you know, that was really my, my approach to it. And obviously, from, as time went on, there were more and more uh, black coaches. But I had an opportunity to spend, spend a great deal of time with Coach Thompson and, and Coach Rabling and see him at clinics or see him at the Final Four and that kind of thing. And, and, and I know they thought I was a pest. <laughs> but every opportunity I you know, I interacted with those guys and well, they have some meetings late at night with some of us young coaches, at like midnight at the final four and mm -hmm. so midnight to two in the morning and just tell stories about, uh, you know, things that they felt were important. And, you know, I never forget, you know, coach Thompson sounded like my mother going like, Hey, confidence is the most important thing. You know, all these other things we talk about are, are, are factors. I and mean, these are things you have to overcome. But you still got to be confident. We, we as black coaches, have to be confident so that when we do get an opportunity, uh, we have an opportunity to succeed because we can do the job. That's right. So, yeah. So um, we're going to get to the to University of Maryland in a minute. But who are some of your your great players that you coach as an assistant at at Old Dominion? I assume uh, Gaddison and Mark West and some yeah, of those. those are yeah, yeah, those are probably, uh, you know, that was our first couple of years of Division One. But uh, like you said, uh, Mark West, uh, Kenny Gaddison, uh, guys like Ronnie Valentine played in the league for a while. So there's uh, four or five guys that played for a while. But, you know, Gaddison and, and uh, West played for 15 years in the NBA. So we, we had some really good uh, teams. And we didn't have a lot of those guys floating around. But uh, – but we had a few of them as a, as a young assistant, Coach Wilson Washington, who was a, went to Maryland, transferred, and then played for many years with the 76ers with Kobe Bryant's dad, Jelly Bream Bryant. Jelly Bean, yeah. yeah, so they played together. So, yeah, so we, you know, our paths and uh, as an assistant coach and recruiting and as a head coach and coaching their paths across a lot of players not great not big names but you know played a lot of great college players and played some of these guys played a lot of years in the NBA yeah uh, I, don't, I don't know if you were at this game but one of the biggest upsets in the history of Virginia basketball was the Mark West Petersburg team it was one of the top 10 20 teams in the nation you may have been there recruiting Mark but they played West they played West Springfield oh they played Mount Vernon from from Northern Virginia Mount Vernon was coached by a, a local legend named Don McCool and Mount Vernon was tiny. I think they may have had a six-two or six-three center. They're very good, but they were tiny. And they held the ball the whole they held the ball the whole game. And they ended up they ended up, I think they won like 46, 45. And you know, were you at were you at that game? Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I was at that game. And of course, uh, uh, Don McCool, is it Don? Yes. Yeah. No, he coached Frank Smith, who I recruited uh, mm -hmm. to Old Dominion. Uh, as well, so I saw Don's teams play for a year. What a great coach he was, and and then obviously uh, Petersburg, but Bill Lawson was a coach there, and they had you know great teams, and, and that was that was a loaded team by the way, Petersburg team. They they got beat. You no, know, I, I saw yeah, a lot of great games and that that uh, U-Haul for the state title and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's let's go to a uh, uh, the University of Maryland. Uh, I assume that you got the job 
the University of Maryland, but your all your networking and the letters you'd written to Coach uh, Giselle, and it was that's probably how you landed that job was at Maryland. Yeah, that was a big part of it, and 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 again, obviously. Uh, he was interested in my ability to recruit players and, and there were some really good players, uh, you know, coming out of high school as they always were in, in the uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia, DC, Maryland area. But of course, Maryland uh, recruited nationally uh, as well, but uh, probably got uh, the wizard. Walt Williams was a guy I spent a lot of time, two or three years recruiting. Uh, Brian Williams, if you remember that name, uh, Bison Daly changed his name to play for the uh, you know, world champion Chicago Bulls and, uh, guys like Rudy Archer, great. It was the uh, junior college player of the of the year. Uh, would he play up in Hagerstown or uh, Allegheny? I think he played at Allegheny Community College. Uh, you know, a lot of those kinds of guys. Uh, Tony Massenburg, uh, you know, another name, but just you know, a lot of really good players. As you remember, probably when you were you just thinking about basketball. I mean, just the area was loaded with players, and Maryland certainly got his got his share and. Uh, Lefty Grizel was known as one of the best recruiters ever, and I learned an awful lot, you know, from him watching the way that he related with uh, parents and coaches and, and players. Yeah, uh, you know, Lefty has this great personality. He's definitely a leader, and he knows how to inspire people. Uh, but I, I think he's he's not necessarily seen as an, an X and O's guy. Is that is that unfair? Or because a lot of these guys, like for example, Beheim, he 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 gets his players to play and they win, and I think it's. He's not seen as the Bobby Knight, but he, he gets the same, the same results for different types of players. Uh, what, what about Lefty? What kind of X and O's guy was he? Yeah, well, you know, I think, you know, the guy's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. And one of the reasons is they, they won a lot of games. And you know the league that he was in for most of his career in the ACC. It's really hard to, to, to win in that league. And a lot, oftentimes, uh, you know, a guy, a coach, or player will be unfairly compared uh, or criticized because he happens to play in the same uh, era as another great player, another three or four great players. So it, it kind of minimizes in people's eyes, you know, the greatness uh, of, of them because they're being compared. Lefty is being compared to Dean Smith, uh, Mike Shashevsky, uh, Jim Beheim, and you go on and on in that in that in that league. Norman Sloan, uh, Terry Holland. These are you know all of them you know great coaches in in their own right. Uh, but, you know, I have to say that uh, Lefty's underrated as a coach. I'm not going to say he was a better coach than Dean Smith or Krzyzewski or you know, whoever, but he certainly, you know, beat those guys uh, sometimes and very difficult for anybody uh, in that league and in the country to beat North Carolina and Duke on a regular basis. And uh, because he didn't do that, I, I think he's unfairly compared sometimes. Yeah. You know, so, well, you got, you got one year with um... – Len Bias, uh, what, what was he like to be around as a, as a player? I mean, he's, you, you coached at, uh, uh, USA national team. I mean, uh, how do you rate Len? Because uh, you saw him on a daily basis, so you got a chance to see what he can do. Yeah, he was uh, he was the best player that I've ever been around as a you know as a player and, and a coach. And, and I'd been around you know guys like David Thompson, and you know I didn't I was not around Michael Jordan, so I can't make that. Uh, comparison other than their, their errors weren't that far apart. So I saw Jordan play a lot. I just wasn't around him and, and, and wasn't uh, in practice with him and so on and so forth. But Len Bias, uh, worth as good an athlete as he was, and, and I never saw one better. And, and, and again, I keep go, going back to Jordan. He's that kind of athlete. Uh, his work ethic was unbelievable. You know, he was a guy that uh, during the summers, he'd work out three times a day. This was before guys were lifting weights. I mean, he's you know, he'd go in the weight room in the morning, come back, shoot jump shots in the afternoon, and he would be there for the for the for the big big time pickup games in the afternoon. And they were big time those pickup games of Maryland because because of the area uh, during the summers in particular, people would come home even if they didn't go to Maryland or anywhere near. They'd come home, and uh, even players who were no longer in college that could really still play in that DC area, they'd come over for those pickup games at six o'clock in the evening I mean, you couldn't get on that court man. and uh but uh that that was him i mean he was three times a day and, and and that kind of thing but to watch him play obviously but to watch him sometimes in practice you see him do some stuff that you just you just wouldn't believe it you just start shaking your head and uh but i saw him do some unbelievable things in practice but I also saw him do some unbelievable things in 
in games, just like I'm, I'm sure you did and, and anybody who's a basketball fan in, in that area. Was he a nice guy to be around? Was he a good kid as well? Yeah, yeah, Lenny, Lenny was a good kid. He was a good kid. I, I think just like anything else, uh, uh, you know, not a bad bone in his body, but I think like anything else, uh, that's a hard existence to get used to where you go from being a, 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 a sparsely recruited young man at North, I think Northwestern High School right there off the University of Maryland's campus to all of a sudden, three years later, you're the big, not only the big man on campus, you're the big man in college basketball. You're a player, you're in college basketball. And uh, to, to take that all in and still, you know, be humble and be the greatest kid in the world, very, very hard to do. So, you know, he, he struggled with that some, but not a bad bone in his body from a great, great family. You know, mom and dad, uh, you know, Christian folks and uh, had two brothers, but just a, you know, nuclear family uh, and uh, just a, a fairy tale, you know, up until, up until the end in terms of where he came from, mm -hmm. how hard he worked. Uh, what he accomplished all the way to being, you know, drafted number two in the draft by the Boston Celtics, their number one draft pick, you know, signing a big time shoe contract with uh, Reebok, uh, with the Reebok at the time. Yeah, I think it was, no, it was either Reebok or Adidas. It wasn't Nike, I remember that, but he, and so it, it was uh, remarkable being around him and that whole existence and, and to a degree circus for a year. And coming from, yeah. you know, Minion, the division school where I played, even though we went division one, it wasn't anything like being in the ACC. So not only I was in the ACC coaching for Lefty Drizel, Len Bias, the number one player uh, in the country is on the team. So it was quite a, an awakening to big time college basketball. Well, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, we all know what happened to Bias. And then, uh, you know, uh, Lester Giselle uh, unfortunately lost his uh, lost his job, and they hired Bob Wade. Um, and Bob Wade, I think they're probably when you think about what we're looking for kind of an authority figure. This was a this was a time where uh, drugs were going were, were ravaging our cities. Wade had experience in inner city um, Baltimore, dealing with uh, you know very tough neighborhoods, and he, he had success. Uh, it must have been a huge transition for Wade going from a a basketball program where he had so much more talent than everybody else. And all of a sudden he is a college coach. And I mean, you had a, you had a 10 years uh, as, as an assistant, as an apprenticeship, he got thrown into the ACC as his first college job, I believe. No, I, I think you said it all. You said both of it right there. It was just, uh, I think some of the reasons that you, you uh, alluded to for hiring him made some sense uh, in that uh, the school in the area was going through a, a traumatic upheaval and part of that was because of the environment in and around schools and like drugs and this and that and of course you know Len uh, died from an overdose of cocaine and so now symbolically in every other way it makes sense to bring someone in in that that their very presence says stability uh, it says uh, you know I understand uh, you know young kids today what they're going through I've dealt with it in the inner city of Baltimore and so on and so forth but I think the inexperience of not really having been involved in the industry of college basketball, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough deal. That's like parachuting somebody into the, uh, uh, we kind of saw that into the presidency and they've never done the job. It, it's, it's, it's really, a, it, it's, it's really a difficult thing to do. And obviously, you know, it, it showed up in a, in a lot of ways and, and there's, you know, certain people that don't want you to succeed, but that's the same thing, you know, all over the country. There's there are people that don't want your program to succeed. Uh, but to be able to recognize some of the pitfalls and recognize some of the advantages you have, sometimes it takes a degree of experience to, to, to enlist all those uh, things in your favor. And I, and I think that was missing there. Yeah, well, you, you, you helped out, I think, immensely, because I, I think you mentioned earlier, you, uh, Brian Williams is one of your big recruiting coups, and I think that, that really helped Wade in his third year. So I know, I know the first year they, they did okay. The second year, I think they didn't – I don't believe Maryland won a game in the ACC. But the third year, you had a pretty good roster, and I think, I think things were on the uptick again. Yeah, we, we got to the second round of the NCAA that year with, uh, with – Rudy Archer and Brian Williams and, and, and that crew. So it was clear that 
um, you know, over time with recruiting and things would kick in that we'd have the talent to compete in the ACC. And, and again, there are just so, some, so many other things are involved dealing with the media, uh, you know, dealing with the recruits and their parents. That, that was really changing during that time where parents became much more involved or uncles became much more involved in the recruiting process. And, uh, and then that was about the time where the shoe companies became really involved in uh, college athletics and the recruiting process. And so a lot of those kinds of things that, uh, you know, made, made, made it difficult. But uh, at a place like Maryland, you're going to be able to recruit enough talent uh, to compete. You've, you've just got to get them going, rolling all in the same direction. Exactly. Well, so uh, you're probably chomping at the bit by now to, to get a head, head coaching job. And you eventually took a job at, at Radford. Uh, and what you, what you just been recently promoted into the Vision One. So how, how, did, how did that process go to get that job? Well, you know, I, I'd started thinking about, and, and particularly after, uh, you know, uh, Lynn passed away and uh, uh, things were, uh, it was an up, that was an upheaval for everybody, including myself. And so I really started, made me reassess, you know, what are you in this game for? What do you want to do? And I said, you know, you got in this game to be a head coach. And so I really started to, to really look and, uh, and see what was available and, and that kind of thing. And uh, Rafford was available. And I can't remember exactly how I made the call or whatever, but I, I certainly, uh, John Thompson was someone who spoke on my behalf. Uh, Mike Krzyzewski was someone who spoke on my behalf. So I really pursued the job and enlist, enlisted all of the contacts that I thought were relevant to help me. Uh, you know, get an interview and that kind of thing. And to make a long story short, I got, got the interview and got the job. And, and, and then there I was, like, looked around, like, what have you done? <laughs> you, you, know, you, you know, in retrospect, it, it seems a little risky. Because let's say, for example, you go to Radford and you don't succeed. You know, it, it probably would have been hard to ever get a, a head coaching, Division One head coaching job again. Uh, so, you know, you, at the time, you just wanted a job. But looking back, it had, it probably was kind of risky going to Radford, wasn't it? Well, the business is risky. You know, you're always faced with those kinds of uh, decisions. Every place that I moved to, there, there was that decision, uh, you know, is this the right thing to do now? And uh, so I, I think the best thing you can do is evaluate uh, the factors on the ground at that time and to make as, uh, you know, uh, uh, an educated guess, but also how do you feel in your gut and your heart and the, the motivation level you, you have to make this successful. I mean, if you look at, if you look at that situation and you look at uh, the things that are important to being successful and you think there a lot of those are at the place you're thinking about going to, maybe not all of them, but a lot of them, then I think, uh, you know, you might make a decision, or certainly I did, to let, let's, go, let's go get this done. And, and something I really, really wanted to do, when I look back and said, that's why you got in this business, and here it is uh, 13 years later uh, from when you set that goal and, and you have an opportunity to uh, go for it. Uh, there wasn't much of a chance that I wasn't going for it. <laughs> One of the players that made a big difference to you that really uh, uh, brought Rapper to the next level and got you to the tournament. And matter of fact, he's still coaching in, in his high school today. Is a, was a local player named Doug Day. Um, he, 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 really, he really was your first big recruit at, at Radford. Uh, is that true? I think that's probably right. And, uh, you know, the thing about Doug that was uh, kind of interesting, and, and most of the players that I'd gotten before Doug were basically from the D.C. area. I, I, I remember that when I first got the job, I basically signed, uh, within a month, I signed five players from the D.C. area, you know, from mm -hmm. DeMatha and Bowie High School and uh, Bishop McNamara and uh, all over. And so that was still a, a, a huge re recruiting base for me. But lo and behold, there was this player next door, Blacksburg High School, probably 15, 20 minutes away, who was putting up numbers. And when I asked people about him, going, oh, no, he's just a shooter. He's, he's not a Division I player of this and that and so on and so forth. Well, I, I went to see him play a couple of times, and I, I just fell in love with the guy. So I don't care what level of high school basketball it is. This young man, because he's an outstanding athlete as well. I mean, you know, uh, great uh, high jumper and, 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 and 
uh, excellent sprinter, those kinds of things, and the guy could flat out shoot it, that's, well, I can get him some shots. Well, make a long story short, he became by far the all-time leading scorer uh, at, at Radford, and as you mentioned, uh, just developed quite a following in that area, still coaches high school basketball in that area uh, today, and and had everything to do with me moving on from, from Radford, uh, you know, back to Old Dominion. Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, let's get to that. So you, so you do, uh, you, you get a chance to, ch to teach the coach at your alma mater, but that had to be re really exciting at the time. Yeah, it was because I, you know, when I left, um, Old Dominion as an assistant to go to Maryland, uh, that job was open and obviously I wanted that job, but n never was really considered. Uh, mm. for uh, for that job. But as I thought about head coaching jobs uh, over the years, obviously that's, that's where I played. I, I know knew everything about that school and, and that would, would have been a dream way back then. But to have another, to have an opportunity to interview for that job, you know, after having three years of experience at Radford and that kind of thing, and then getting it, that was like a dream come true. That was, I felt like I'd probably coach there for the rest of my coaching career. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the thing about that this job was, and unlike some jobs where you got to rebuild, you actually had some talent coming in. So, I mean, you're, you were going to recruit some great players like Odell Hodge and others, but they, they had some good players coming back to you. I think P.D. Sessions was already there. and uh, no, the no, no. Score, I no, no, I recruited all those guys. No, we, we were actually, right? yeah, we lost Keith Gatlin, who went on and played. Uh, is Keith Gatlin, 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 yeah. Gatlin's last name. And he went on to uh, play uh, in the NBA. No, Ricardo Leonard. Ricardo Leonard is the guy we're, that you're talking about, right? Yeah, Ricardo Leonard was left, yes. But, but yes. they lost, they, you know, Tom Young, who was, a, you know, Hall of Fame coach, ended up getting fired because they'd lost the last three years, including with a first-round draft choice, a Gatling is kid. It? So I, wow. so when I came back, Ricardo Leonard was left over, and Ricardo Leonard ended up being my center at six, six and a half. And, uh, and that was, you know, about all we had, except we had some junkyard dog-type guys who'd been playing – six three six four guys and and uh and then we started to recruit after that but that first year we went to the ncas with you know six five six six center and and you know a bunch of guys that just were happy to be in a new environment and in uh up-tempo game we brought the pressure defense in up tempo game and and uh and we played small ball way back then and we're able to to really jump start things and then we bring in odell hodge P.D. Sessions and, and and those guys. And now and Mike Jones from DeMatha High School. Mike Jones, mm -hmm. And uh, then we, we, we really start, had much more talent those next couple of years. But uh, the program was now back to being established to what it was and and uh, just had a you know wonderful three years as head coach there. So uh, Frank Smith was uh, was your assistant at Old Dominion. I, know his, I think his brother is playing for you at ODU. Is that, is that true? Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right, Barry. Barry did. Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, as I mentioned, I recruited Frank uh, to play at Old Dominion when I was an assistant there. You know, an unbelievable career in high school basketball and football, as you remember, but also had a, a great career at uh, at Old Dominion. You know, all time leading assist leader and uh, the uh, floor general for so many good teams. And then I was able to hire him. I'm trying to remember what whether I had him at Radford for a year, but I definitely had him for Old, at Old Dominion for the entire time. And obviously, you know, knowing so much about the school, great ambassador, he was a natural to, to help us attract uh, some outstanding uh, high school and junior college players. Yeah. So I remember going to uh, quite a few of your Old Dominion games with, with, your, brother, with your brother, Gerald, and the, the program really became established. I think you went into the Colonial, they left the Sun Belt. By the time you got there, you went into the Colonial, and you guys were perennial, you know, uh, top of the top, top near the top of the standings, and it's it's going well. So you mentioned this earlier. It, uh, there comes a time when when you know, you're doing well and you're coaching, and other jobs will come. And you got this. I know you had a beautiful house on on the beach down there, and uh, but you know you have to have that ambition. So you know, I guess Dayton eventually comes calling. Um, did you? And, and Dayton, people, a lot of people don't even realize what a what a, a tradition Dayton has. Dayton's been a basketball uh, power. I wouldn't say powerhouse all the time, but it has a great program. It's got great local support. 
in, in the in the fifties and forties, I believe they had some awesome teams. It's one of those programs that's really underrated by a lot of the, uh, the basketball people. Did you have to take that job, or was it a was it a hard decision to make when you eventually went to Dayton? Well, the, the hardest thing about the decision to go to Dayton was uh, the fact that I was, you know, in a lot of ways at my dream job. I was where I went to college. I was, as you mentioned, we just built a house on the on the beach down there, and and, and all those things. Uh, but at the same time, in terms of in the profession itself, you know, I, I wanted to accomplish as, as much as I could. And I just felt like, uh, you know, Dayton approached me, uh, you know, about coaching there. Uh, you know, I wasn't interested at first, but the more they talked and the more I went back and reviewed things that you talked about, tradition and, and, and then going out there to see how important basketball is to that area, that school and that, that town, it was just like, it, I got kind of blown away by it. So it was a very difficult decision to, to leave, but, uh, it was because of the attractiveness of the University of Dayton situation, uh, the tradition, uh, the importance. Uh, Thirteen thousand people are going to be in the stands for every game, and uh, and then uh, financially, uh, you know, you, that's that was important. When they talk about uh, you know doubling your salary, and you know, I had a buyout at Old Dominion at the time. They said, nope, we'll take care of that. When they start saying what will it take, uh, then that gets your attention. And from, from there, over a two or three day period of time, I made that decision. One of, one of the toughest decisions that I've ever had to make. Yeah, I remember you going through that and uh, Gerald just says, you know, when you're coaching basketball, you get an offer. You know, these, these are things that it's just, sometimes you have to go. And, uh, and, yeah. and obviously you, you were there, I mean, you, were, you were there a, a long time, um, uh, you know, relatively long for, um, for coaches now, nowadays. Um, so it must have been a place that you, you enjoyed coaching. No, it was, uh, I, I think it's the best pure college job that I, I've ever had in terms of how important it is, crowd support, the uh, financial support, uh, in terms of we'd have a meeting each year and they, they would say to me, what, are we, what obstacles do we need to remove for you this year to, to make it uh, possible for you to keep progressing? And that's one of the things that we did there. It seemed like every year that we got better. And, and, and I don't think it's, a, it's it shouldn't be a surprise that we got better because there was an investment in getting better. That was a, there was a, first of all, there was a physical meeting to say, okay, what do we need to do uh, to move forward and get better? And then there was follow-up. Uh, we built the uh, Donaher Center while we were there, this um, unbelievable basketball facility at the time, may have been the best locker room, meeting room, basketball center in the country brand new and, and to this day it still is a separator for that program but those facilities that makes a huge difference when you're bringing young men and uh, coaches and their family in to see okay where's where's this young man going to be for the next four years and all of a sudden you've got state-of-the-art uh, facilities uh, you've got 13,000 fans uh, in the stands uh, you know, that that's a uh, enticing environment for a young, young, young player. And it certainly was an enticing environment for me, knowing that I would have those kinds of things to offer uh, to recruits moving forward. Well, I think it's probably even more important in a place like Dayton. I, I got family in Yellow Springs, so I'm not, I'm not oh. talking badly about Dayton at all. But it's, it's not like an urban, if you're trying to uh, recruit kids from the city, the more benefits that you can provide them, probably the better chance you have of landing those big, big prospects. Uh, oh, absolutely. You know, the facilities are, you know, are huge. Like you said, we're, it's not like you're offering the social life of, of a city, although, believe it or not, there was a there was tremendous music scene down there in Yellow Springs yeah. was part of that. Uh, more mm -hmm. so than, than people think, kind of a, a, a rich tapestry of, of culture in that area uh, that I was not aware of until, until I got there. But, mm -hmm. the, but the facility piece, uh, the fan piece, those kinds of things for a kid coming from the city uh, becomes awfully, you know, awfully attractive. I mean, mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like this before. And, and, and most of the kids that came from the, from the city, we, got, we had Nate Green and, uh, and uh, Day Day from D.C. area. They, they, they loved it there. They loved it there. Yeah. Well, again, uh, one, of the, one of the stories at Dayton is going to be your ability to, to recruit, and, which you've always proven. Uh, but let's just talk briefly about a couple of Northern Virginia players. Uh, one of your first recruits, I believe, was Kobe Turner um, um, from, from Lehigh School, now Lewis High School in, in Alexandria. 
or, or Springfield. Yeah, Kobe had a great, great career uh, for us. Uh, that was uh, a big time signing for us. We had to recruit him, uh, you know, hard. And uh, he came in from day one, just scored a whole bunch of points for us, won a bunch of games. And, and I think it just kind of, it opened up uh, uh, some other recruiting paths for us because, you know, that was a fairly big name for, for us. Uh, and particularly at the University of Dayton at the time to get a get a Kobe Turner and boy, he did not disappoint. Yeah. Is it is it hard to evaluate kids sometimes when kids come like Kobe did from a from a program where they score so much? I mean, the the, the lead program, they they would, they would put hundred points on the uh, on the board every game. So when you have kids like that, all the lead kids average twenty average twenty a game. Does it make it hard for the recruit for the recruiting because it's it's hard to envision them in a in a a regular type of, um, uh, of, of offense. Right. Uh, there's a, it, it's, it's a, there's a, a, a process that I went through. I think most good recruiters go through in terms of evaluating uh, players. You, obviously you look at the numbers, you can put, look at the numbers on paper, uh, but then you look at things like you just alluded to. What's the competition level like? Uh, then when you go to watch him in practice, what's his work ethic like? Uh, you talk to all of the people around him, including guidance counselors and teachers. You're looking for a red flag, but you're also looking for green flags. When they say, you know, this guy, you know, he may not be the best, you know, math student in the world, but, you know, he, he'll give it his all. You get him some tutoring and this and that, and he'll give it his, you know, give it his all. You meet the family. You know, his mother was a, a she was a princess. I mean, she was just a, a really nice person. And, you know, Apple doesn't fall very, if you meet the mom and the dad and they're, they're not good people, you know, you, 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 you check that, put that mark down. Don't, yeah. don't, uh, don't forget that. So there's a process that you go through. And particularly, like you said, when you, when you go like, well, this kid scored a bunch of points, but you know what, he gets to shoot it every time. They're not playing a great league. Then you look at these other intangibles. And you go right down to the, go right down the line, and then over time, I probably saw Kobe play 10, 15 times, maybe probably more now. When you look at summer league, uh, then there's then there's the gut, you know, the gut. What do you, what do you what do you feel like? You see a lot of players over, over the years. Can this guy get it done? And and think about Kobe, just watch him play in a pickup game sometimes. Was even because Kobe wasn't going to score. I don't care who was out there, he was going to score. Yeah. And so when you got a guy like that, and you can uh, bring out the team guy in him. In other words, he's a good teammate. Then you can adjust the other things because a lot of times, if you've got other good teammates around, the players will adjust uh, to uh, to each other over time if they're good people. If they're not good people, uh, you can't, it's very hard to build chemistry and, and have guys meld together as a unit. And Kobe wasn't one. I mean, he wasn't one of those guys. Even though he scored a bunch of points in high school, it would be easy to be a spoiled brat. He was not that. He was a good kid that you know wanted to win, but boy, he could put it in the basket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so how, how about uh, Tony Stanley? Uh, Tony was one of the one of the, the best clutch pure shooters that you ever see. Uh, no shot is too big for him. He's like he doesn't put up in, in high school. He didn't put up the kind of points that Kobe did. But if you want a big shot, he's he's definitely your guy. I, I think Tony Stanley is probably the most talented player I ever uh, recruited at Dayton. Uh, and obviously, you know, won a lot of games for us, took us to a couple of NCAA tournaments and, and uh, that kind of thing. Just a pure jump shooter, but also uh, he's a guy we could stick in the middle of his own and flash him in there. He could do damage there. We could throw backside lobs to him. Great run. I'm just a terrific player. You know, Tony was a challenge to coach a little bit because uh, he didn't want to go to class a whole lot and those kinds of things, although he's a very bright, bright young man. And you know, back in those days, uh, if you didn't go to class, I mean, you were talking about missing practice and games. So it was always a challenge to to make sure that he was in class and, and those kinds of things. But, you know, come game time, obviously, the guy could really, really play. I, I thought Tony would end up playing the NBA uh, for a long period of time. He ended up, you know, having trials with, you know, a couple, three different teams. But for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And he so played in France for many, many years. And so I'm, I'm sure he... In fact, I want to say he married a young lady from over there, but had an outstanding career and you know played over in Europe, and I'm sure he uh, enjoyed enjoyed that. But big, big time talent. Well, like like your pattern was throughout your career, uh, as soon as you really 
it really takes off. That's when you end up uh, getting another job and then you're back in the, the same decision-making place. You know, later on at Dayton, you had a really balanced team. Uh, I guess a guy named Parks, I, Brooks Parks, I believe was his name. Um, Brooks, Brooks Hall. Brooks Hall, yeah. Uh, that team, you had like three or four guys in double figures. And I think your last year, uh, I think you might've even been in the top 25 for much of the year. Um, or, or some of the year, at least. Uh, mm -hmm. How about, tell, tell us a little bit about that team, if you can remember much about yeah, it. Yeah, that was, a, no, that was uh, probably, yeah, that was by far our best team at uh, Dayton. We won the Atlantic 10 uh, championship. Uh, we were, I think we were a top four seed in the NCAA tournament. Uh, I think at the end of the year, we're in the top uh, 12 in the country or, or something along mm -hmm. those lines. Outstanding team, uh, some big, you know, big time win. Brooke Hall was terrific. Uh, offensive player, just a, a nifty offensive player, really not as talented as a Tony Stanley, but more skilled. And, uh, and I want to say those, oh, those two guys played on played on uh, at least one team together, if not two teams together. Um, but that team was unselfish. Um, you know, I, I, I'll never forget the, uh, I guess it was a semifinal a game against St. Joe's. That was a team that had uh, um, uh, lefty from uh, on hard uh, time. Now. Oh, his name comes to me. Jameer I can't pull it either. Yeah, Jameer Nelson was a point guard, and uh, they had two NBA guards. Both of them played in the NBA for uh, ten years at least. And uh, Ramad Marshall was our point guard, and the team they just and and St. Joe's had a great great year that year, and and they just took them apart. Uh, and won the uh, Atlantic 10 championship, but just a skilled team that was uh, was better than the sum of, of its parts, really played well together, and won a lot of games and had tremendous success. And you know, as you mentioned, you know, after that year, uh, Clemson came called. Yeah, so, I mean, the other decisions that you had to make were very, very tough. I mean, going, uh, leaving Old Dominion was, was, very, was very tough. And, but this decision, I mean, all, all coaches, I guess, we can all understand the dream of coaching the ACC. Yeah, I had a lot to do with it because, as I mentioned to you uh, a little while ago, I, I think Dayton was probably purely the best basketball job uh, of the ones that, I, that I've had. But uh, I, I was an ACC kid. I grew up in Maryland and, you know, that's back when, you know, before Lefty took over and I watched Lefty take over and, and, and uh, you know, start to recruit uh, nationally and big you know, upheaval there and watch so that was back when South Carolina was in the ACC and, That's and right. uh, watch all those, uh, you know, games. I mean, uh, uh, every week there was like one or two games on maybe on Thursday and Saturday, they're ACC games. And so right. to have an opportunity to coach in the ACC was exciting to me, but at the same time, it wasn't lost on me because as I watched those games, I also watched Clemson <laughs> and Clemson was a doormat. <laughs> Uh, you know, of, of the ACC. And so now I had to make a determination whether, you know, I could turn that around in the face of uh, the best league in the country and the best coaches in the country. And um, that was, uh, you know, was, there was a little bit of a conflict uh, between me and, and the folks at Dayton in terms of uh, contract and this and that. And then in, in the breach, you know, comes Clemson, who's just like Dayton was before going like, well, you know, what do we need to do to, to get you interested? And so to make a long story short, I interviewed with them at the final four. I went back to the school, interviewed, you know, loved the, loved the school. And, you know, I'd, I'd been there before because I was at, an assistant at the University of Maryland. And uh, so, uh, you know, I just said, you know what, let's, let's time, now's the time to go for it. And it, it was more, it wasn't more of a bravado thing, but that was part of it. You know, I can do this. You know, I've been preparing for this and, uh, we can get some recruits and and uh, and do this, and uh, so I made a decision to go, and uh, and I'm glad I'm glad I did. As I mentioned, I think uh, Dayton was the best basketball job in terms of their commitment to their program, but not a better experience than coaching in the ACC, you know, against the Shishevskis and the uh, you know, shoot, back at the time it was uh, Paul Hewitt was there, and they went to the. Mm -hmm. Final four. Leonard Hamilton was in the league and still is and doing great. And you, know, you go right, you go right down the, you know, down the line. You got like some underrated coaches. Herb Herb Sendak was a was, was heck of a coach. Terry Holland was coaching at the time. And then of course, uh, 
you know, they've, they've, they've switched since then and built a new building and, you know, look what that program's at. So there's a lot, and then Virginia Tech came in the league. So a lot of things uh, you know, happened to make it a tr- terrific experience, but that was, uh, that was best. That was the best experience. You know, when you, when you, when you think about coaching against those guys, uh, you know, you get, you, get, you get these crises of confidence. I mean, all of a sudden here you are, you're putting a game plan together for uh, Mike Krzyzewski or, you know, I guess, you're, you're a confident guy. I know you always feel like you're going to win, but did you find yourself like, you know, this, this is a challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm going against Duke with all these, you know, uh, top 10 recruits. Uh, you know, what, what was that? What was that experience? Like, do you have to really raise your game? Well, you know, I, I think the thing that probably developed in my coaching ability during that period of time, uh, probably at Dayton more so than at any time was understanding the, uh, the psychological part of the game much better and understanding that so much of, of, of winning is really believing and, uh, and really believing in the game plan to the point that you were going to almost blindly follow it and give it everything you got. And what I just discovered and just over watching, so you, don't, you just don't watch your team play. You just don't watch your opponents play. You watch a lot of college basketball over 20 or you know 30 years and what I discovered very clearly is any given night you know if, if a team is on their home court for example and they're really fired up to play and they got a game plan and they're going to go through with it uh, and then the team that they're playing against maybe rank um, higher than them or in first place or whatever psychologically most of the time they're not going to be as sharp so understanding those dynamics of the sports psychology part of the game is huge and because there's always a subplot there. And that's what most people, you know, don't end up figuring out. I'll tell you who does figure it out is Vegas. <laughs> they they figure out what what are the, you know, what are the 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 what are the dynamics of both teams? Are they coming off the of back to back? Uh, and the other team's got one night rest, or they've been sitting for a week, or you know, obviously somebody's sick or hurt or whatever. All these things are in. And as you look at every game, every game has its own subplot. And when you look at it that way, and even a five game period of time has a subplot. So you look at a five game, uh, you look at a five games coming up, uh, obviously as you get toward tournament time and those kinds of things, uh, that's the part that people don't really see. And they go like, well, how are you gonna win? That's, you know, that's Duke or that's North Carolina or this is, well, that's Duke, but you know, Duke's ranked first, we're fourth right now and Duke's, played on Thursday night. This is Saturday. We haven't played since last Saturday. We should be more energetic. We should be more fired up. We should win. So that's the way that I would think about it, for example, whereas, you know, the average fan is going like, well, no way, you know, no way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so understanding that, uh, you know, has a lot to do with you plotting out a game, plotting out a five game period, plotting out a, 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 a conference season plotting out the entire season. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier that Clemson had kind of been a doormat at the ACC. And I think they did have some, you know, some good teams at times, but in general, they were, they were a football, Clemson's always been a football school. When you got there, did you realize, yeah, this, this is why, this is the challenge? Or, or did you already know going in, like maybe it was a football school or maybe the kids from the, from the urban areas would rather go even if, even like the triangle in North Carolina is more exciting than maybe Clemson in the country or, or mm-hmm. Atlanta, mm-hmm. Atlanta is probably more exciting for a lot of these kids like Georgia Tech. Right. Well, certainly the football aspect of it is, uh, was, was huge. And, the, and again, the sports psych part of it, I chose to look at it as, you know, let's make this a positive. I mean, you know, football uh, weekend, you know, Clemson, South Carolina is like, is like a four, final four event. So now you center a good deal of your recruiting uh, in the fall around that. And, you know, that feeling you get at a Clemson football game, and if you're coming to visit, it's hard to escape getting kind of caught up in that. And then you play off of that with your, the other things you do in your, uh, your, your recruiting weekend. You're showing them tape. You're showing them facilities. You're bringing them to your house for dinner. P- uh, Clemson, I don't know if you've been there. It's a beautiful uh, uh, lake. Mm-hmm line area, you know, you take them out to your house on the lake, you know, those kinds of things, uh, you know, to psychologically 
uh, allow that young man and his family to see themselves in that situation. And then talk about, mm -hmm. you can make this happen. It's not, you know, kind of never been done here before. You can be the person that, you know, tur turns mm -hmm. the tide here and look what it would be like. So you're kind of painting that dream, that picture, those kinds of things. But there's no question that the football is a big influencer uh, both negatively and positively, and I try to use it mostly, most most of it on the positive side as something that would benefit us and something that would be attractive. And, and I think for the most part, we did that. Yeah, and also one thing you're able to do is uh, you're able to start getting the top 50, top 100 recruits like you did when you were at University of Maryland uh, under under Lefty and Bob Wade. So it, it, so it, it was it was difficult to establish that. But then you started getting all the, you started getting some big name recruits. Started getting better, better and better players. I, I, I think we were never going to beat North Carolina and Duke uh, straight up for someone, but they couldn't take everybody. And so what was important <laughs> when you really like somebody to figure out where there's, where those young men were on those schools pecking list. And so if you felt like, well, you know, North Carolina and Duke want this young man, like a Milton Jennings with one of the McDonald's all Americans we signed there. But then you figure, okay, but where is he for them? If, if he's third for them, then you show him much more love, much more, much more love. So it's not even comparison. And then just ask him the question, who wants you more? And, and so the, again, understanding uh, each individual recruit situation, but if he's number one for them, don't spend all your time, uh, you know, going to see every one of his games. You might see one or two, and then, you know, you go on to the guys who are higher priority for you, who you have a better opportunity to get. The other thing that we did is we made a massive um, style of play change when we went to Clemson, because we felt like we weren't as, we weren't going to be as uh, uh, good from a skill standpoint. We weren't going to get those guys. So we went for the athletes, we went to a pressing running style of play full on where Dayton, we were man-to-man, -man, half court man-to-man, -man, quarter court man-to-man -man team that powered the ball inside and that kind of thing. We just opened it up all, we just threw caution to the wind and we recruited athletes uh, and convinced them this is a much, um, much more fun way to play. And we, we became a feared team in the league because of our uh, style of play. And, uh, and it's, it's just one of those things that, not only could you sense that teams respected us, but it gave us a lot of confidence knowing that we could be a team that, that, that could streak on you at any second. You know, that we, we had that spurt ability and the crowd loved that. And everybody kind of got caught up in it. And all of a sudden we had a, an identity, you know, as a team and uh, as a program. And, uh, and it made for, you know, we ended up being the third winningest team the, uh, in the league Why? while we were there behind North Carolina and Duke. And obviously we beat uh, those, those teams as well. Do you think you would have been fulfilled if you, if you had spent the rest of your basketball coaching career at Clemson, if you would have just stayed there for the duration? You know, it's hard, it's hard to say, you know, because uh, probably, I mean, yeah, I think so. I mean, I think if I stayed at Old Dominion, you know, it would have been a fulfilling, but I, you know, I was always trying to, to win that state title, win that national, uh, championship to get better, uh, you know, didn't want to take a backseat uh, to anybody. And uh, so I, I was always looking to push. And, uh, you know, as I left Clemson, we were, you know, pushing for better facilities, much like we had a date and practice facility, this and that. And that was a little bit slow. And then along came, you know, DePaul, you know, saying a lot of the same thing. Now, the way I looked at DePaul in Chicago, it was a, be it was a better opportunity for me to affect change in society, because that's Chicago. We started a found, charitable foundation at Clemson, did very well. We raised, uh, I think, a quarter million dollars for uh, coaches versus cancer. And we saw that ability to grow. But then I said to myself, if we're successful in Chicago, an area of 10 million people, what can we do with that kind of thing? Not to mention that at the time, and, and people forget this, the Big East was by far the best league in the country. So, I, and uh, we just talked about the ACC and, and how much fun and what an experience that was. But uh, at the time, you had in the Big East, you had Syracuse, uh, you had Louisville, you had Pitt, you had UConn, you had Notre Dame, along with the same teams that are in the Big East now. It was a 16 
16-team league that was getting 11 teams in the NCAA at, 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 you know, at one time. So the Villanovas and the Georgetowns and all those teams were uh, UConn's. It was a um, unbelievable league. What a challenge. I mean, it, big challenge. Uh, like Chicago, uh, I like Chicago, I kind of like the politics of it, you know, in terms of, and so there were a lot of things there and not to mention they were talking about tripling my salary. So there, there's a, you know, a lot of things there that said to me that we can accomplish even, you know, bigger things here, uh, you know, if, if we're successful and, uh, you know, didn't end up turn out being that way, but we did have, we had a great experience there, uh, loved mm -hmm. living there and got two grandkids there and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, no, it's a decision to, if I had to make it over again, I'd, I'd make that same decision again. Yeah. So like the one thing, uh, DePaul, it's, to me, it's one of the challenges of college sports in that the conferences lose their culture. Like DePaul had part of the Big East, you know, we, we grew up, the Big East was the, um, the, the gritty, uh, scrappy schools of, of, the, of the Eastern Shore. Uh, um, um, Eastern, Eastern Shore, yeah, Eastern yeah. Seaboard. Uh, the the, the uh, ACC is Tobacco Road. It's, it's the eight Mid-Atlantic, South Mid-Atlantic colleges. Pac-10 are, 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 the, are, the, are the schools out in, on the Pacific uh, on the coast. Um, do, do you think the conferences, they lose something when you lose that, when you lose that culture and that, that identity that, that you've had for so long? You, I, you do, but over time, you know, people's memories sometimes get, get short. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the big tests in your theory or our theory here is a school like Maryland going to the Big Ten. You know, that was hard for me the first two or three years, just like, you know, wrapping my mind around that. And I think for the first time, maybe it was last year, I kind of felt like, you know, Maryland is in the Big Ten. And okay, this kind of makes sense if you go beyond 25 years ago from a geographic standpoint and, and all that. And then of course, you know, the television media today, I like back when, you know, you and I first watching basketball, we saw one game a week, games all the time. But I think that five years from now, 10 years from now, I think Maryland will be totally accepted that they're a big 10 school. It takes a while because I, I couldn't get used to that. Maryland, yeah. you're talking about Maryland and big, big, big 10. But I, but I think yeah. you do, lose a little bit of that and that's the same thing that 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 happened with the uh the biggies almost got too big that time I was talking about when all those teams were in it now it really tried to go back to its its original culture with this 10 team league when when you know when you had Georgetown but they added some teams like Butler and Creighton but uh basically it was uh you know uh private Catholic schools are the are the hub of it which was the hub of it when it was Providence and Georgetown and Villanova and Seton Hall and that was it. That was a, that was the yeah. core of it, and we'll, we'll never forget that. You know that period of time with the mm -hmm. Ewings and the Chris Mullins and and and, and all of that. And wait a minute, what a great great league! Still, still a really really good league, but it was an unbelievable mm -hmm. league way back then. Then it became that super league that I think only last two or three years when they had all those really good teams mm -hmm. in it. But it was by far the best league in the country. I remember when I, when I would when I would talk to you during your during your coaching stints, you were always willing to change with the times. I remember at Old Dominion, you you briefly did the uh, Loyola Marymount. You guys are really up tempo. You were always. I remember one time when everyone was shooting three pointers. You went the other way. You're like, no, we're gonna, we're going to go to the hole in the fourth quarter. We're, we're going to go to the foul line in the fourth quarter. I mean, you're always willing to change the things that you believed in and uh, try to stay stay current. Well, in today's game, it's more of a positionless game. I mean, every, big guys dribble the ball. I mean, there, there's really no rules anymore. Every, everyone's all over the place. Do you think you would have been a different coach in today's game? Or how, how do you think you would approach today's game? Well, I actually like that. You know, for, you know, we did some of that way back at Old Dominion where we would uh, we play small ball and it kind of did it out of necessity that we had, you know, a bunch of smaller guys who were good, our best players. And then so we kind of put them out there. And, and then we, as we put them out there, we realized they have matchup problems. Our five man shooting threes and they won't come out. <laughs> and so there was, you know, half the games during the season where we got our five man wide open. You know, people would adjust that, but he still, if, if they play a big guy, he's still not gonna be able to, you know, follow our guy out there. So we did that. And then we always had a small, what we call a, you know, a small team. And, and usually if we were up uh, 10, 12 points, six, eight minutes to play in the game, we'd go small. 
Now you got to chase us around. You got to chase us around. We're going to spread the floor. It's going to open up opportunities for us to go to the basket. But if you don't come at us, you know, we're going to hurt you with that, that three. And, you know, we won a, you know, a, a lot of those games. Now that's really the way the game is played for the most part. Now everybody's four around one or five out. Uh, and basically the way the game is played today. And I'll tell people this sometimes and, and they'll go like, oh, yeah, you're right. But it, you don't, they don't really think about it. People either shoot a three and they shoot a layup. And in between game, remember, in between game was important to us growing up. You know, that little banker off the glass, that, you know, one, two mm -hmm. dribble pull up. Coaches don't like that anymore because over the course of time, it's an analytics thing, it's a math thing. Over the course of the game, if you're shooting threes and layups you, and, and, and you shoot a decent percentage from three, you should win. You know, if you show up on defense. And so most coaches now have, have kind of gone to that. You look at the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the national championship game with, uh, uh, with Baylor and Gonzaga. Well, first of all, Gonzaga really plays well with that. That big, you know, that big center there really, he just didn't have a good game. It's really a matchup problem. But Baylor was spread there. They, they just couldn't guard him. And, uh, and so, that's a big equalizer, the three-point shot. Remember when it first came in with the 35-second shot clock and all that? It took, now it's like domino. It, it, it's the thing. Yeah. And layup. So it's either you either shoot a layup or you shoot a three. And that's that's the biggest change, uh, you know, in the game. I mean, the center is up. You don't – no one's mad if they don't have a center. Back when you and I first started playing the game, it's like, you got a center? <laughs> you got a big – who's your, yeah. who's your center? People don't even ask yeah. that question anymore. You know, they hardly even ask that question anymore because, you know, everybody's, uh, even the centers can step out and shoot the three. So you, so you still enjoy the game as much? You think, um, besides all the recruiting uh, things that make these games more challenging for a coach, uh, do you still enjoy the game, as, watching the game as much as you would have uh, no, 20, 30 no, years ago? No, 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 not at all. I, I uh, then I was addicted to watching and all that. After 40 years in coaching, I don't watch it as much. I, 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 uh, I skip around. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I haven't watched some basketball. I'll watch five minutes here, five minutes there, you know, or, or whatever. And, and I just don't watch it nearly, nearly as much as I uh, used to. I just, uh, you know, had enough. 40 years, it's not only games during the season, but, you know, watching five summer league games a day and, you know, when you're out recruiting and that kind of thing, uh, uh, seen it, seen enough of them. But, you know, anytime there's a great game on, I'm looking forward to the NBA playoffs, for example. Anytime there's a great competitive games on, then, you know, then I enjoy watching. But I just don't, you know, set up my day the way I used to, to, you know, to, to get ready to watch, watch a game or watch a particular game or whatever. If there's a particular game, I'll, I'll get fired about it. But, but not, not like back in the day. Yeah. Do you, do you have any current involvement with basketball? Uh, I am on the, uh, I did a little bit of TV work for a couple of years when I first got out doing some uh, uh, conference tournament uh, studio work. Uh, don't do that. Haven't done that in a couple of years. Uh, the last three years I've been on the NIT selection committee. So I, uh, mm -hmm. me along with, uh, what do we have? Uh, five or six, uh, maybe seven or eight uh, uh, former coaches and athletic directors. We meet at the same time the NCAA committee meets uh, to pick the, uh, you know, the uh, 64 teams. And then they come out with theirs on Sunday afternoon. And we come out an hour and a half later than that with our selection uh, for the NIT. And uh, so, uh, and, and that's been fun. That's been fun. You get, you're watching some teams and, and you certainly realize how important the NIT is to so many programs because you see so many programs they do well in the NIT the year before and then next year yeah. they make it run the NCAA tournament and uh, you know so, so it's important to the players and the, and, and the teams and, and, and all of that and a lot of coaches lose their job but they don't get in the NIT and mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. it, it, it's important uh, it, it's part of the game I think it's uh, I think it helps uh, the game and program, the players that have that, those experiences of playing in postseason play. So, so I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, well, Oliver, man, this has been great catching up. I, this, I, have, I have to get a Zoom to actually see these days, but uh, 
hopefully maybe you and Vicky will come to uh, Ocean City this this summer. We we can meet up there at uh, uh, and maybe even your your buddy's house, Kip's house for uh, for July fourth. We in fact we will be there for that. We will be there for uh, that, and uh, but I look forward to seeing seeing you there. And you still spend uh, time at Riddle Farms, right? Yeah, we we do. We, uh, we just haven't. We just haven't, uh, you know, the last two years we haven't got, we haven't gone up there. But um, oh, now that the COVID is yeah. hopefully breaking, maybe we'll start doing some things. Yeah, no, I look forward to, to seeing you down there, man. It's great talking to you. Thanks for thinking of me. Yeah, yeah, this is a great honor. I mean, uh, there's so much great basketball uh, nuggets here. I, you know, I can't wait to, to post this and, and listen to it back. Uh, but let, let's keep in touch, and we'll, we'll definitely get together this summer. I look forward to it. Okay, say hi to, say hi to family for me. Right. Okay, buddy.